Welcome to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Becker, and thanks for joining me back in the Sunflower House. On today's Speaking of Women's Health podcast, I'm going to cover a few different topics, including the most common concerns about the vulva. And I am taking highlights from one of our most read columns on speakingofwomenshealth.com. And it was authored by a retired partner of mine, long-term OBGYN, Dr. Lynn Simpson, who is enjoying her retirement. She delivered thousands of babies and then ended her career in our Center for Specialized Women's Health, focusing on outpatient gynecology. And it's amazing how many eyes have been on this column about just no-nonsense, common, important information that women need to know about caring for the vulva. And the vulva is the external part of the female genitalia. And vulvar concerns are very common reasons why women seek gynecologic care. Now, some of the vulvar concerns that should lead to a medical evaluation, including the following symptoms like itching, burning, pain, vaginal discharge, lumps, bumps that are new, ulcerations, pigment changes, pustules, new odors, rashes. And there can frequently be a combination of several different symptoms. And occasionally women try to self-diagnose and the most common culprit is yeast. Sometimes self-treatment can be successful, but it can make the problem get worse and prolong more serious health concerns. Itching is a very common vulvar complaint, and there's lots of different causes of itching. Sometimes it's a yeast infection, but many times it is not. Now, some of the most common vulvar uh, conditions, which include yeast candida yeast infections, bacterial vaginosis, which we'll talk about in more detail, are more likely in women that are low in vitamin D. So if your vitamin D is not normal or you haven't listened to our vitamin D podcast, go back to uh, one of the first few episodes of our podcast. Now, other types of problems can cause itching or burning, and herpes genitalis is a concern. Warts, the medical term is vulvar condyloma. And there's other conditions that are not necessarily an infection or an invasive infection, just a condition of a change of the bacterial flora, like BV, bacterial vaginosis. Now, trichomonas is a parasitic infection that can be irritating and cause a strawberry cervix. Now, there's lots of non-infectious problems in the vulva. DIV squamative inflammatory vaginitis is a non-infectious cause of itching, pain, and profuse vaginal discharge. And sometimes that diagnosis is difficult to be made, and it does require specific treatment. Anything that can affect the skin in the body can certainly affect the skin of the vulva. And some people can have sensitivities, allergies to a substance or a substance causing actual irritation of the skin. Even products that you might have used for years can all of a sudden cause a sensitivity. The skin of the vulva changes with age, hormonal status, environmental concerns like heat and occlusion that can occur from wearing tight clothes or non-breathable fabrics like nylon. We really like white cotton crotch underwear. And I like to tell women that just like you'd care for a baby's vulva uh, very carefully and sensitively without any kind of chemicals. The same thing happens as a woman gets older. And atrophic vaginitis or genitourinary syndrome of menopause is very common with lack of the sex hormones. And the itching can be caused from decreased hormone levels, which can in turn make the skin more vulnerable. Now, substances that you should avoid on the vulva uh, include irritating creams, gels, alcohol wipes, feminine sprays and products, uh, deodorant soap should be avoided, 
spermicides, and it's very important to avoid panty liner use unless you're bleeding because the liners just hold in the bacteria. And I've often mused and asked women if they're addicted to panty liners and they're like, how do you know? And we have underwear to keep our clothes clean. We don't need to use a liner to keep our underwear clean. And I always tell women, it's okay to buy new underwear. And it's actually not a bad idea once a week to do a separate load of just your bras and underwear, double rinse to get all the soap out, consider using a less irritating type of detergent like you might for a baby's clothes. And then when you put it in the dryer, Definitely don't use a dryer sheet because you don't want that residue on the tissue that's going to touch your private areas. And don't hang your undergarden uh, garments outside where there can get be pollen. Now, a common skin disorder, which we know is autoimmune, we're, we're not exactly sure of the exact culprit. It's not infectious. It's not hormonal, although lack of hormones can make it worse. And sometimes it's very difficult for us to tell the difference between Uh, vaginal vulvar atrophy or chorosis vulvae and lichen sclerosis chronicus. And lichen simplex chronicus is a skin disease that can cause itching and it's kind of similar to eczema. Other chronic skin disorders like lichen sclerosis, lichen planus, which women can have in the mouth and the vagina, psoriasis, which is another common skin disorder, can also affect the vulva. Now, chronic vulvar skin disease is, cannot be completely cured, but it can be managed to reduce and eliminate symptoms. And vulvar itching can occur when there's no specific findings on exam. And the itching can be accompanied by burning, rawness, painful sexual activity, and irritation. Now, vulvodynia is an extreme sensitivity to touch, especially right around the opening of the vagina. It's a very frustrating condition, but treatments uh, are available that can be helpful. And I find that in postmenopausal women with vulvodynia, they tend to need higher systemic estrogen levels because estrogen does help the peripheral nerves. Diagnosing a vulvar disorder. Well, you want to see a gynecologist or a specially trained gynecologic physician assistant or nurse practitioner. And any bumps, lumps, skin cracks, tearing, ulceration, pustules, peeling skin, skin color changes can be both infectious or non-infectious. And they can be painful or non-painful. They may just uh, affect just a tiny part of the vulva or, or the whole area. And it may or may not involve the perianal area. So some of the infectious things we think about are the DNA virus herpes, uh, warts, molluscum contagiosum, which looks like a little papule with a little umbilicated uh, indentation, yeast, Canada, and uh, there can be some uh, Canadas that are hard to get rid of like glabrata, and some Canada infections can cause a lot of burning. There can be staph and strep infections, which are bacterial infections, There can be varicose veins of the vulva, which feel like a mass, or blood vessel nodules, or sebaceous cysts, which are common in the hair-bearing areas of the labia majora. There can even be skin cancers. So you really need to see your gynecologist, your family physician, or perhaps a dermatologist. And along with the exam, the physician might order other tests that might include cultures. And after obtaining the results of the testing, a treatment plan will be determined. And there's a lot of different concerns. And it's very important to have a thorough medical evaluation so the treatment can be implemented. You don't have to suffer in silence. Help is available. But it's very, very important that you follow the do's and don'ts. And we give women a long list of do's and don'ts for vulvar care. And a helpful tip if you think you're coming down with a little bit of yeast or a little bit of bacterial vaginosis is to get some over-the-counter Refresh vaginal gel. And Refresh has P capital H as in pH because the pH of the vagina is a lot healthier if it's acidic. And things like blood and sweat and semen increase the pH which allow 
different types of bacteria and yeast to grow. You want to have a healthy gut microbiome and a healthy vaginal microbiome. So eating fermented foods and yogurt that have active colonies of the healthy bacteria are important. Trying to avoid systemic antibiotics, which can lead to a vicious cycle with uh, refractory yeast infections. So what is BV, bacterial vaginosis? It's common, it's annoying, it's not an infection per se. It's not vaginitis as an inflammation. It's rather vaginosis, a condition. And it's related to a difference in the bacterial flora of the vagina, which allows overgrowth of a bacteria called Gardnerella. And it can lead to this fishy, amine odor, grayish colored discharge. So in essence, you just have overgrowth of the bad bacteria pushing away the healthy bacteria. Normally, a high percentage of bacterial, vaginal bacteria is the healthy lactobacillus. That helps to keep the pH of the vagina acidic, which is hostile to other types of yeast and bacteria. But anytime you raise that pH, it will predispose to BV. And certainly antibiotics are a common cause or chronically elevating the pH of the vagina. As with blood or semen, uh, as well as just postmenopausal atrophy uh, makes the, the skin shrivel up and get thin and not have as much glycogen. And sometimes when we treat the bacterial, um, or when we treat the atrophy rather, and the cells plump up with glycogen or sugar, if there is any yeast around, some women will say, oh, I get a yeast infection as soon as they treat the atrophy. So it does take a while when you improve the integrity of the tissue of the vagina for the lactobacillus to colonate and then decrease or colonize and then decrease the pH of the vagina. Anytime you have new vaginal symptoms, uh, you need to be examined and evaluated for potential sexually transmitted infections, common yeast infections like Canada vaginitis, parasitic infections with trichomoniasis, uh, being checked hormonally to see if you might have vaginal atrophy or genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Some women may have a retained tampon, and I have seen a number of women in my career, and they're very embarrassed by it, but you know, you're a busy woman, having heavy periods, working, taking care of elderly relatives, taking care of your kids. Um, sometimes uh, a tampon can be shoved up around the cervix, Allergies and immunologic problems like lichen sclerosis many times are missed, uh, but are easily treated. And the one condition we don't ever want to misdiagnose or miss is vulvar cancer. So if it's thought that maybe you have lichen sclerosis and you have a little short course of a topical potent steroid like clobetazole ointment and things don't get better, then you need to see a specialist and get a biopsy. Now, some of the risk factors for bacterial vaginosis are low vitamin D, a new sexual partner, and douching. Don't douche. It just shoots bacteria right up uh, into the uterus from the vagina. And a poor diet. I mean, having a lot of sugar and sweets uh, are not good for you and can raise the blood sugar, which predisposes to uh, irritating conditions like yeast and BV in the vagina. If you're sexually active and you have recurrent BV, you should boost your vitamin D or get your levels checked. Um, have your sexual partner wash his penis with plain soap and water before any sexual activity, just like you wash your hands before you eat. Uh, many times men will touch different things, go to the bathroom, and then wash their hands. But if they've touched bacteria and then touched the penis without washing the penis, you can transmit bacteria. Now, you don't want to excessively scrub, but any type of any um, sexual toys or vaginal dilators should be washed with warm, soapy water. And these can be transferred from person to person, regardless of the sex. And any woman with recurrent BV should wear plain white cotton underwear as opposed to thong underwear. Now, problems associated with BV include premature delivery or miscarriage if pregnant. 
And if you have BV and you get exposed to HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, you're actually more likely to get infected with HIV. We can diagnose BV by looking at a vaginal smear and seeing what we call clue cells, which um, is a cell that has a lot of bacteria adhered to it. Or we do a simple vaginal DNA quick test in the office, and it can determine and differentiate between BV, candida yeast infections, and trichomoniasis. There's lots of different treatments for BV, including metronazole, either oral, which you can't drink any alcohol or alcohol mouthwash, or vaginally. Uh, clindamycin can be used vaginally, and tinidazole can be used orally. But if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, you need to let your physician know. And if you're taking either metronidazole, which is Flagyl, the brand name, or tinidazole, you must avoid all alcohol, even alcohol-based mouthwashes, because you can get an abuse like reaction with severe nausea and vomiting. Now, a few years, there was a new FDA-approved treatment, one-day therapy called Solasec, or Secninazole, approved for non-pregnant women between the ages of 15 and 44. It's a two-gram dose that comes in the form of a two-gram packet of granules. And you sprinkle the granules on applesauce or yogurt or pudding, mix it up, and eat the mixture within 30 minutes. And you don't chew or crunch the granules because uh, that can affect the absorption. Now, since most current antibiotics for BV must be taken for five to seven days, this single dose therapy is very exciting and promises to improve adherence and thus the likelihood of curing BV. If you were breastfeeding and you had to take this medicine, you would need to cease breastfeeding or do what's called pump and dump for up to 96 hours. Now, on our Speaking of Women's Health website, we do have several helpful additional companions to this. We have a free vulvar disorder treatment guidebook. Uh, We have other instructions on properly caring for the vulva and vagina, and other information about how to prevent vaginal infections. A word to women who have lichen sclerosis. When you treat it with a potent anti-inflammatory ointment, and we use ointments instead of creams, once you have stabilization of the condition, you still need maintenance. And I see a lot of women who get better and then they stop their treatment and then they get a flare. It's a chronic condition that needs to be treated. So I hope you found this episode of properly caring for your vulva and what you need to know about bacterial vaginosis helpful and informative. If you're able to, please go on our nonprofit Speaking of Women's Health and press the donate button. We much appreciate any donation to support our nonprofit, which is designed to keep you healthy, strong, and in charge, which is our motto. You've been in the Sunflower House with your host, Dr. Holly Thacker. And please subscribe anywhere you get podcasts. Apple iTunes, Podbean, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Stitcher, Spotify, so many different places to listen to interesting podcasts. I have updated my uh, book, The Cleveland Clinic Guide to Menopause, and there's several different chapters and topics. Uh, We have a wealth of information, and I hope that you will join us back in the Sunflower House for the next edition of Speaking of Women's Health.